Okay, hey, listen, this is good to be back again. Uh, this is Dr. Jay Smith. I'm here in my office with all my illustrious books on subjects concerning the 7th century Islam. We're looking and trying to find any uh, artifacts, any buildings, any inscriptions, any letters, anything that will get us back to the 7th century over here because everything we're getting from all the Muslims is over here in the 9th and 10th century. And one of the things I have been doing is trying to get friends in who have done studies much better than I have done, who are ahead of me in many different areas. And two of them are right here with us right now. Uh, we have Mel from Sneakers Corner and we have Murad, who is from the Middle East. Uh, the reason why I like these two guys is because they're scratching the, the, uh, the ground, they're finding artifacts, they're finding all kinds of inscriptions, they're finding all kinds of material that is proving that the Islam that we have grown up with, the Islam that we have been taught, the Islam, the only narrative there is for this Islam is not at all from the 7th century, it's from the 9th and 10th century. And one of the things they're looking at right now is the Dome of the Rock. Now you've heard us talk about the Dome of the Rock. This is the building that was built in 691 by Abd al-Malik. Abd al-Malik, the Caliph, uh, the Umayyad Caliph, uh, who came to power in 685 and continued up until 705. He is known as the great Arab reformer. And we've talked an awful lot about him because he is the one that introduces the coins. He is the one that introduces uh, the caliphal protocols. And also he is the one that builds the Dome of the Rock where we first see the Shahada uh, written. Now, we need to look more at the Dome of the Rock because we've talked a lot about it. We've gone into it, unpacked it in previous episodes. What we want to do today now is look at the inscriptions because there's some new things that we're finding out about those inscriptions that help us understand why the Dome of the Rock was built. And also why that, that when we say inscriptions, these are Arabic writings on stones, very beautiful writings. They're very ornate. And yet these writings on stones are not what we thought they were. But rather than me going off and prattling on for another half an hour, I'm going to bring my good friend Mel. Mel, uh, you are from Sneakers Corner. You have your own YouTube site. Go to Sneakers Corner. Take a look at what he's doing. He is pushing the blanket on this. The other one, Murad, he is our Arab expert. He is the one that's actually the one we just did uh, an episode on the four references to Muhammad in the Quran. He is going so far ahead in looking at the Aramaic antecedents to Arabic. And we're gonna be doing a whole series of studies looking at where Arabic came from, where the Quranic Arabic came from. That's what we wanna look at. The Quranic Arabic came from in the seventh century and precedent to that. But here is Mel. Mel, this is your area. Thanks for coming on board. Tell us a little bit okay. on why you wanna talk about the Dome of the Rock especially. Well, there's two main reasons why the Dome of the Rock is of interest. The, the, the first reason is it's the first public announcement to the world that Muhammad was the leader of a religion called Islam, even though they didn't at that point use the word Islam. So that's the main, one of the main reasons. The second main reason is it's a good area to investigate in terms of when the Quran was written. And today, one of the things I'm going to argue is that there are clues even in the rock inscription that would suggest that this is an antecedent to the Quran. And uh, yeah, for those who don't know what he's talking about, this precedes the Quran, is what you're saying. You're saying this, it, yes. this is a beginning, this is precedes the Quran, and the Quran is derived from these descriptions that we're going to lo be looking at. Exactly. So, um, I will um, just share my screen while he's bringing up his screen. The, the reason why that is important, and you can see immediately why Mel is wanting to go to this. We've always wondered where the Quran came from, where it got its references from, and we've always surmised that much of the material that we have in the Quran today is borrowed from other sources. Primarily from, we know, Jewish apocryphal writings, we know from Christian sectarian writings, but what, don't, what uh, Mel is going to say, take a look at the date, we're starting with this building here, gorgeous looking building, anytime you go into Israel or Jerusalem, you'll see this building. But let me just say, when you look at that building, that is not the original building, is it? Because, uh, Mel, when was this part, this facade, that dome built? Do you know the date for that? I don't know the date of that. That wasn't my main focus. But the I know the golden roof itself was actually um, put on it in uh, the 1960s. So that's actually relatively young. Okay. But and it's, but it's been true. worked on at different times over history. This building has been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. 
So oh, yeah. most people think this is what actually of the money, but no, he did build what you're looking at right there. That what you're looking at there was built in 1876. So you're talking about 19th century. The dome itself, the gold plating on the dome was added in the 1960s. That's just in the last century. But what we're interested in is not this outer part. This is much more recent. We're interested in the only original part of the building that exists, still exists today. Over to you, Mel. What is it that we're looking at and why is it significant? Okay, so we're going to be looking inside at the rock inscriptions, which are contained in the inner part underneath the dome. Um, before I look at those rock inscriptions, I just want you to notice the shape of it from above. You notice that it's octagonal in design. And the, I suppose one of the things is, where did it get that idea from? Well, in my research, I discovered that only three miles away in Jerusalem, or actually just outside Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, there was a church that was contemporary with the Dome of the Rock. It was built in 456. It was called the Church of the Catisma, or the Seat of Mary. And it was built, in, as I say, in 456 by the widow called um, Ikelia. Now, what's interesting is that there was a rock in the center of it, and it was supposed to be a rock that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had sat on on her way to Bethlehem. So that's the significance of it. And it was lost to history until archaeologists discovered it in 1992. And as you can see, it is pretty much the same in design to the Dome of the Rock. And the focus of this uh, church was, it was dedicated to the Theotokos. Um, and it was the first, first church that was named that um, in response to the Council of Ephesus Declaration of Mary as Theotokos. And that's going to be interesting because, as we know, Abdul Al Malik was actually against that idea that um, Mary what, was. What Theotokos means. Most people don't know what that means. Um, that that means that she is the bearer of God, the mother of God. Mother of God. There it is. So Muslims would actually have us believe that uh, Mary was simply the mother of a human being and nothing more. Whereas this church declares Mary as the mother of Jesus, who is both God and man. So obviously this would be a key thing to attack um, when um, Abdul Malik was establishing this new religion called Islam. Uh, Murad, okay. isn't it the case that in the Quran, 25 times you have reference to Jesus, the, the son of Mary, Jesus, the son of Mary, Jesus, the son of Mary, em emphasizing that very point that you're bringing up, Mel, that Jesus is always seen as the son of Mary in contradistinction that the Christians that they believe thought Mary as a Theotokos, she is the mother of God. And there, this is an emphasis, it's a polemic against that idea. It looks like that this, this, the, the, if this is the church that's dedicated to that, that idea, then it would stand to reason then that the Dome of the Rock could be a counterpoint, a polemic against that. Yes, the, when the Quran reference to Jesus, he calls him the, the son of Mary, so that when you read it, you do not say son of God. It's just uh, a way of diverting you out of this point. Absolutely. And that, so would make, move... that would not make sense unless, of course, this idea of Theotokos was rampant in that part of the world, which, as we see, was. Here's a case in point with this church. Yeah, so uh, there's the ground plans of it as they found it. Um, I'm not in entirely sure when it w was erased. I've heard contrary stories. Some say it was destroyed in the 620s. Some say it was still in existence at the time the Dome of the Rock uh, was being built. It's hard to say. But clearly, at some point in history, they decided to get rid of it. Um, obviously, the, the Islamic supremacy was, was um, uh, one of the reasons. Okay, so if we look at well, the insult... Before, before we get into the inscriptions, can I say one more thing? Yeah. There is another theory, a secondary theory, that, is, that I've referred to earlier, and that is that uh, the question is, why in the world do, would you put a church, I mean, a building, the, this structure, the biggest of its day in Jerusalem, if you're up there in Damascus, if that's where the Umayyad political center was, is in Damascus, if their sanctuary it was in Petra, as we're finding out, why didn't they build this in Petra or Damascus, why in Jerusalem? And I would suggest the reason why in Jerusalem, and look where it is in Jerusalem, it's up on the hill, looking down over the Church of Sepulchre. Remember, the Church of the Sepulchre was the sanctuary for the Byzantine Christians. 
That's where has that's where they would come for their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So this sits above it, looking down onto it, facing Absolutely. Petra, not facing Mecca. It's directly facing Petra. And uh, this was built in 691. If you put that there as a one-upmanship, and you give it the great, the most beautiful building of its day, and on top of that, you use the same structure, you use the same architectural structure of the octagonal shape that you brought up, Mel, to counter counter the the Theotokos Church. Then that would be a, a thumb a thumbing your nose at Byzantine Christianity and the Byzantine theology. That then is a good segue into getting the, uh, looking at the inscriptions because the inscriptions seem to suggest this as well. Because remember, when Muslims talk about this building, they do not talk about Jesus Christ. This building was created by Abdul Malik to commemorate the Miraj. Murad, what is the Miraj? The Miraj is basically the night journey of Muhammad from this place all the way to heaven to get the deen. Uh, which is basically the five prayers uh, after meeting with Moses, then came down. And that rock that you can see there that you have, Mel, that's the rock that he went, uh, ascended to the seven heavens. Am I correct? So that's why it's the third most holy shrine in Islam, to commemorate the Miraj, which supposedly happened in 621, when he went on the back of the winged horse from Mecca up to Jerusalem and then went up to the seven heavens. If that is the case, why is there nothing at all written about it in, in the Dome yeah. of Rock. If yeah. that is the whole reason for building that building, then why does nothing refer to it in any of the inscriptions? Absolutely. Okay, over to you. So, as you can see, if you see the figure of the man there in the inner ambulatory, the rock inscriptions are to be found on either side of him, okay? So, up, up above. So, th those to his right are what's referred to as the outer facing ones. And those to his left are referred to as the inner facing ones, just so we're clear. So as he would uh, walk around the, the central rock in a similar fashion to the way uh, Muslims walk around the Kaaba. Yeah. So the, the idea was that they, they would pray going around this seven times in a similar fashion to what was done in Petra around the Kaaba. So very similar idea behind it. Um, the other thing to bear in mind as well is this is, the rock that both Jews and Christians and even Muslims believe was the rock that Abraham sacrificed um, Isaac on, though Muslims claim it was Ishmael. Um, so that's an important element as well. Um, I would argue that there was a sect prior to Islam called the Abrahamic sect, and this was part of their theology and, and one of the reasons why this dome was important. There are references also in the early histories that refer to it not as the Dome of the Rock, but the Dome of Abraham as well. So that's that's one of the reasons why it was so important. Can I add just uh, one layer to this before yeah. you go to the other slide? Uh, in the early Muslim literature, they call the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Arabic. In Arabic, it's Kenisat al qiyama which means the Church of Resurrection. Actually, the first Muslims, they called it Kenisat al qimama which means the church of rubbish, where they throw their rubbish and burn it there. So this is very clear that it was against this Byzantine uh, Christianity. Wow. Yeah. So um, a common Muslim challenge is create a verse or surah like that in the Quran. And, you know, a lot of people have attempted to do that, but you actually don't have to go too far to find examples of that, we only need to look at the Dome of the Rock for examples. So as I'm going to show you now, um, we're going to see verses that are on the inscriptions that look and feel exactly like Quranic verses, mixed in with Quranic verses, but ardent Quranic verses. So we start with the outer facing ambulatory wall, um, and I've excluded repetitions, just to, for brevity's sake. Those verses which are in green are found in the Quran. Those in red are those which are not found in the Quran. And anything that's in black are simply notes that have been added for the, the slideshow. By so you, there's no indication. These are your notes, not by added by other people. Yes, these are my notes, just so that, that we're clear. So there's, if you were to look at them, there's no, there's no clues which of these are from the Quran and which are not from the Quran. 
which I'm going to argue would suggest that this came first rather than the Quran, because it is inconceivable that someone would treat non-scripture as on the on a par with scripture. You know, um, in other words, you would. Point. I think this need bears repeating. Are you all getting this? What Mel's saying here? If this, since you have that red part there, that is not in the scripture. The green is in scripture today in chapter 112. That's Surah 112 you're looking at uh, above Surah 48 and Surah 3. But here, if this was, if this is in the Quran today, the green part, why in the world that the Dome of the Rock, if the scripture already existed prior to the Dome of the Rock, why would they add to scripture by putting the red in there? There is no God but Allah alone. He has no associate, which is the Shahada. Why is that added there in Surah 112? Because that, that would confront the Quran itself, if it had come earlier. So what Mel is saying is, no, it's the other way around. This is probably the, the antecedents to the Quran. The, in fact, we can't find anything earlier than this for this scripture, except at the Dome of the Rock. So this would probably be the precursor to the, to the scriptures itself. Exactly. Now, if we look at the one in red, if we treat that as a couplet, you will not find that in the Quran. You will find the first part, um, but he has no associate, is not part of it. It's only found in this rock inscription. Yes, now, if we, Why would he have, he has no associates there, since that, that's not part of the Shahada as well? Who is that against? That's a, an attack on the Christian belief in that's the Trinity, I would have said. Christian, which supports exactly what we're saying. These were created to attack a person. When it says he does not beget, nor he, was he begotten, who is that against? Absolutely against Christians. Okay, can you say all attacks against the person of Jesus Christ, his divinity, against his being associate with God, and the fact that God the Father and God the Son. So you can see there are four attacks right here within that one verse. And actually, it's, it's, it's kind of similar to the idea that when you're trying to identify who you are, sometimes it's easier to say who you are different from. So they're distinguishing themselves from the Christians by saying we're against this, we're against that. Now, if we look at that um, verse, the Shahada, and investigate where it came from, what I found is that the Tawheed copies pseudo-Clementine homilies um, in Book 16, uh, Chapter 7 and 9. Hes esten ho tios ke plen o tu uk esten, which is Greek, and it means God is one, there is no God except him. And you can see there it's from the early fourth century. So this is clearly plucked from that source, whether it was from a written source or, or just that it was, um, it was in uh, oral tradition, it's hard to say, but it was certainly a, um, something that came before the Dome of the Rock. Well, this is a formula, Mel, is what you're saying, that is that precedes both the Dome of the Rock and the Quran by 300 years. Exactly. So if we take an, another example here, you can see most of, of the inscription that's in green there is from the Quran. And yet we have this uh, line, may Allah incline unto him. This didn't seem to make it into the Quran for whatever reason, or it, it was dropped out of the Quran. So whatever way you look at it, if, if Muslims want to claim that the Quran came first, well, this would argue that they have lost a verse from the Quran. If this came before the Quran, then you have problems. So either way, if you want to argue the Quran came before this, or the Quran came before this, either way you've got problems because you're crazy. It, it is pres yeah, there's problems either way you want to argue it, um, and it it's clear in in terms of the way the the verses are presented that they're all of equal standing. May I just say either one take a look? This is against Jesus again. Have you noticed? He does not acquire a son, nor does he share his sovereignty with anybody else. Do you see this? Again, this is a, a, almost all of this can be seen as a polemic against Byzantine Christianity and the idea that Jesus is God. Absolutely. So if we um, look at the, the next one here, uh, Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. May Allah incline unto him and his angels and his messengers and may peace be upon him and Allah's love. Now there's a couple of things. It's assumed to mean Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, but actually um, it doesn't define whether it is or not. And perhaps Murad can, 
can confirm that. You have to interpret whether it means the messenger or a messenger. Well, in Arabic, it's just Muhammad Rasul Allah. And if you remember the last video we did about the four references, this could easily be blessed be the messenger of Allah, since there is no A and there is no the. So it's just Muhammad, messenger of Allah. This is if we will take it literal translation. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. The other thing I want, the other thing I want to point out is, do you notice how it's referring to Allah's love? Now this is very interesting because this is earlier than what you find in the Quran because there's no reference that I can find to Allah's love in the Quran. This was something that um, seems to be alien to. Um, the Quran. It but certainly it's refers to, to us. It's not alien to the Bible. So if this is referring no. to Jesus, then this would fit perfectly with what we see in the biblical context. If Muhammad here is the blessed one, blessed the blessed be the messenger of Allah. May Allah incline unto him and his angels and messenger. May peace be upon and Allah's love. That would make sense because we see that right through the Bible. If again, absolutely the big if. But the fact that it does not, it's, it's not found in the Quran. I think is highly is highly speculative and shows that there has been a corruption. Absolutely. Um, here we, we have an entire passage here that's not in the Quran. Um, it's referring to the, the one who built it as Abdul Allah, which I believe means slave of Allah. Am I right, Murad? Slave of Allah or servant of Allah. Yeah. Um, and uh, Amen, Lord of creation, which is Rab Alamin in Arabic, I mean, uh, Rab Alamin, and this is a very common um, phrase that you find in rock inscriptions in the seventh century. So it's clear to me that a lot of these phrases that they used were borrowed from common um, uh, formula that were used across Arabia in, on rock inscriptions. So it wasn't anything divine or anything like that. Um, I don't know if any of you want to say anything, but I'll move on. Yeah. So in this one here, the interface in Amdatry, um, you see most of it is from the Quran, and then there's an outlier, Muhammad is a servant of Allah and his messenger. What I would like to draw your attention to is the second last line. And trust Allah and his messengers, and do not say three, desist, it is better for you, for Allah is one God only, blessed is be he, how can it be that he has a child? Now most people, if you ask them, would say, that this came from Muhammad's teaching, okay? That he's against the Trinity, even though the word Trinity. I know where you're going to go with this, Mel, but before we do that, can we still look at this real quickly? Because yeah. this backs up what we've been saying all along. Notice, oh, people of the book, so it's referring to us. This is specifically to Christians. Don't do mm -hmm. anything that should you should not do. Don't add to what you already know. This Jesus, son of Mary, so it's talking about Jesus now, is nothing more than a messenger and his word to Mary. And his spirit, that's interesting. The spirit, that's a whole other problematic difficulty. But notice it say, then it attacks the Trinity. So it's attacking Jesus' divinity, showing that he cannot be associated, is what we heard earlier. Now it's attracting, attacking the idea of him being triune. Three, desist. Yeah. That's what you want to get yeah. to. But again, this is an attack against Jesus' divinity. It's an attack against his, the Trinity. And then you can see that it's an attack against the idea that God could have an associate. So all of these are built into just this re, uh, reference. This all is very much a polemic against Christianity, very much a polemic against, and that's why it would make sense it's in Jerusalem and why it's sitting about looking down onto the Church of the Sepulchre or the Theotokos that's a three miles away. And actually, that's an interesting point, Jay, that you just made there, because actually the third last line, the second last night line, if you look at them, they kind of contradict each other because the, the third last one suggests a belief in the Trinity. If you look at it, it's, it's, it's referring to the Son, the Father, and the Spirit because you can't, you know, if, if you have a Spirit and you have a Word um, and, you, and the Word is the Son, so that would suggest a Father as well. But in the next line, it's saying you do not say three, desist. Now, if you, if you don't look at the historical context, that makes no sense. But in the next slide, I'm, slide, I'm going to explain a, a very important historical context which explains this apparent contradiction. Mel, could you, could you just uh, get back? Yep. You see the, the important verse, which is the one in red, the one above, this is not in the Quran that we have today. It yep. says, Muhammad, servant of Allah and his messenger, 
then it goes to people of the book and it keeps going against Jesus. Here again, if you just take Muhammad as the blessed one, it will be that the blessed one is just a servant of God and just a messenger. He is not. Now, don't say three, and don't, uh, uh, like the say is Jesus is divine. So it keeps going in the same context against. So what you're saying, Murad, if I understand you correctly, it, it could be a reference to Jesus. Muhammad is the servant of Allah. It makes sense to re- that it could be a reference to Jesus there. Am I right? Yes, the whole context is just about Jesus. Yeah. Okay. So if we just look at the context then, this appears to reference the Sixth Ecumenical Council held in Constantinople in 680 to 681, which is exactly 10 years before the Dome of the Rock was built. So it was the 10th year anniversary which among other matters condemned John Philoponus' teaching that seemed to suggest that the Trinity comprised three divinities. He argued that since hypostasis is not an accident of divinity, it must be the case that the three hypostasis of the Trinity are three particular divine substances with distinct properties. Now, essentially, John Philoponus was arguing that there were three divinities, or at least that's the way it came across. I don't think he... He literally meant it to be taken that way, but it came across that way. And of course, the council condemned this because it was undermining the idea of the Trinity. But what's interesting is the Dome of the Rock seems to be agreeing with this sixth ecumenical council, probably because uh, Abdul al-Malik liked this strong monotheistic message that the council had. So it's quite interesting. So this is just 10 years after, I mean, sorry, this is 10 years before the building of the Dome of the Rock. 10 years prior to this, you have this council, ecumenical council there in Constantinople. He would have been aware of that uh, being because he had been caliph from 685 on. So he would have been well aware of what that happened five years earlier. It then that stands to reason what you're saying, Mel, that this would then be a, a rubber stamp of their conclusions. Absolutely. And I, I think... In a way, this would have made a lot of people happy um, because there would have been Christians who would have been very happy that this, that this teaching of John Philoponus was condemned. Um, those who were um, Abrahamists, who were very strongly monotheistic, they would have been happy. So this would have pleased a lot of people at the time to include this in the rock inscription. Okay. Now, um, here we find evidence that this was made, in other words, the rock inscriptions were made before the Quran. So I just draw your attention to the top two verses. Now, the, the verse in red, once again, is not in the Quran, and the verse in green is in the Quran. So if we look at it, the two go hand in hand together. Allah, incline unto your messenger and servant, slave, Jesus, son of Mary, and let peace be upon him, be, on, be upon him, sorry, the day he was born and the day he dies and the day he shall be raised alive. So it fits nicely together. Now, if we actually go to Surah 1915 and look at the line before it, we'll see something quite strange. So if I can draw your attention to the right-hand side of the screen, the subject of these verses is different this time. It says, and dutiful to his parents, and he was not a disobedient tyrant. And then it says, and let peace be be upon him the day he was born, the day he dies, and the day he shall be raised alive. So as you can see on the right-hand side, the second verse seems to have been borrowed from the rock inscription, but they put it with a different subject entirely. Does that make sense? On the left. Yeah. And uh, Jay, you were saying earlier that, that this... Um, passage was connected to a completely different topic. Do you like to mention yeah, about that? Look at, at chapter 19 of the Quran. Verse 14 and verse 15 have nothing to do with Jesus. This is all about Yahya, who is John the Baptist. On the left hand side, which is in the Dome of the Rock inscription, it's now referring to this to Jesus. Him, third person singular, is verse 15 of Surah 19. That's referring to Yahya. Yet, if you go to chapter 19, verse 33, you will see that Jesus, this refers to Jesus, that's in verse 33. 
and what they have put there in the Dome of the Rock is in verse 15. So it seems like they've confused the two. And I would suggest the reason why is they want to take that that which was referring to Jesus, I'm sorry, to Yahya, and had it referring to Jesus. There's a lot of cutting and pasting going on in the whole tradition, you know, whether it be taking things from the rock inscription and using it for surahs and, and ayahs and so on, and chopping and changing and so on. So this is just examples of that. Okay. Can I, can I just say something? Yeah. They, they chose anyone, whether it be Yahya, Abraham, anyone. Just remove Jesus from here, because here he will be, he died, and then he will be raised alive. This will be against what the Quran wants to say. So they just butchered what was in the Dome of the Rock, which makes perfect sense, the one on the left. And yeah. then they added John the Baptist to it. Excellent. Yeah. Good point. Obviously, they don't want to have uh, Jesus dying and rising and so on. Exactly. Okay. And as you can see, the rest of the inscription there, it's pretty much um, from the Quran, taken from different surahs hobbled together. Um, the next thing I would like to refer to is a grand... Quickly, one more time, Mel. Yeah. Last statement, it hobbled together. If that is the case, this almost surely shows that this must be antecedent to the Quran. The fact that these are today not hobbled together, these are... If this was just... If this was after the Quran, then why is it they wouldn't have it all in the same sequence? The fact that it is all bits and pieces from all over suggests that the Quran was written at a later date and put it into a much more stylized form. Yes, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so I'm just going to move on. So um, in addition to this, there is a grand cover-up um, by the Abbasids, which I'm going to tell you about. An additional inscription on the drum which supports the dome. So this is a different part of... Uh, of the Dome of the Rock. Um, in gold lettering on a blue background, it, it read, Hat built this dome, the servant of Allah, Abdul al-Malik, commander of the faithful, in the year two, two and 70. At least that's what you would have read in 691. Today, however, the inscription reads slightly differently. Instead of the name Abdul al-Malik, we find Abdallah al-Imam al-Mamun, the explanation for this change lies in a forgery. When the Umayyads fell in 750, the Abbasids did everything possible to obliterate the memory of their dynasty. The Abbasid Caliph um, al Mamun, 813-833, erased Abdul al-Malik's inscribed name and replaced it with his own. Repairs were carried out in the Dome of the Rock during the reign of the Abbasid Caliph Mamun, and the architect who was in charge removed the tiles bearing the name of Abdul al-Malik and replaced them with new tiles on which the name of Mamun was inscribed. Fortunately for us, he overlooked the tiles bearing the date of the year of the year 72, which was left intact. So somewhere along the line, he was told to remove the evidence, but he didn't consider the year that important, so he left the year and that's how we know that there was a forgery done at a later time. It was not until the 19th century, in other words, um, 1,000 years later, that an archaeologist who was aware that Mamun was born over a century after the year 72 discovered the forgery. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. Okay, so concluding remarks. Um, we see non-Quranic verses side by side with Quranic verses, and they are treated as on a par with each other. They are indistinguishable stylistically from Quranic verses. It does not appear that they have yet a Quran at the time of this inscription in 691. And we also see an attempt to cover up the past through the deletion of Abdul al-Malik's name. So those are the three main points that I, I wanted to make today. Well, this is exciting. This is important because if you look and see what's happening politically, you can see why this all makes sense. Remember that Jerusalem was, was finally taken over by the Arabs. I'm not saying Muslims. I'm saying by the Arabs in 638 and 639 or roughly in that, round, that uh, period. And once they took over Jerusalem, then you can then understand why now by the time Abdul Malik comes to power, 
Jerusalem has now been under the control of the uh, of the Arabs. And in the case by, from 661 on, it was under the uh, control of the Umayyads. Abdul Malik is a caliph of the Umayyads. So we're talking from 630, or so let's say 640, up until 690. So by this time, uh, 50 years, they've now been under control. And here's what's interesting. If you look and see what's happening politically, who are, who is, what is the greatest threat? What is the big, biggest political threat to the Umayyads? Well, the biggest threat are the Byzantines. The Sassanids have been destroyed. They're no longer a political threat. By this time, when Abdul Malik comes to power, all the way from Tripoli, or in fact, all the way uh, from North Africa uh, in the West, all the way to Afghanistan in the East, this whole swath of land was under their control. The only other big power, the only other political power, the ones they're still paying tribute to, uh, is Justinian II, who is the Byzantine. But here is Abdul Malik in Damascus, he wants to now thumb his nose, politically speaking, at the Byzantines. So what does he do? He builds this building right slap dab in the middle, right there in Jerusalem, looking down over the Church of the Sepulchre. Also, he uses the same architecture as the Theocotus, which is the, the church that had been built in the 5th century to commemorate the God, the, uh, the, uh, Mary as the, God of, the mother of God. And then he slaps all these inscriptions around it, attacking everything that the Byzantines believe, attacking the idea that Jesus is God, attacking the Trinity, attacking his sonship, attacking his associate with, associate with God, and attacking the begetting and the begotten. Fascinating, at the same time then, by doing this, he puts it right there in the middle of Jerusalem, not up where his capital is, not where his sanctuary is, in Damascus or down in Petra. He puts it in Jerusalem. So not only is this a one-upmanship, this is a polemic against, of course, against the, the, uh, the Byzantine Christians. Once he does that, he then also introduces it on his coins. When he introduces it on his coins, take a look and see what Justinian II does. He goes to war with him. And then he really thumbs his nose by, because in 693, then he introduces another coin with his own image on it. And then by 696, he takes the image off and he repeats much of what's in the Dome of the Rock. He repeats on that coin along the, uh, the outer parts of the coin, proving that this is a polemic against a polemic against a polemic to usurp Byzantine Christianity and to place himself as the now the Muslim, because he now introduces the name Muslim. He all now introduces the name Islam. All of these are introduced by Abdul Malik, and they start from 691. They start from the Dome of the Rock. They start on the coins. He is now placing this as not only a political confrontation, also a theological confrontation yeah. against what he considered to be the polytheism of Christianity, and he is going to be the monotheist, the one who brings him back to God as one. The other thing I would point out, um, they had already been through two civil wars, two fitness, and it was really important to bring everyone together, have you know, absolute loyalty, and to encourage the virtue of submission, which is really key, uh, key to them. So they were trying to discourage rebellion, they wanted everyone to be united, and what a great way to do that, by starting a religion that would put that as the highest virtue to kind of pull the empire together, because without it, the empire would certainly fall apart within decades. Listen, this is excellent stuff, but we want to give the last word to Murad. Murad, you have something else that you'd like to say that we would that you would ask us to do, wait for at the very end. Give us the last word. The last thing is that uh, all the inscriptions in the Dome of the Rock does not refer to the Arabian prophet Muhammad. It does not refer to the night journey. And it almost definitely is just an attack on Jesus Christ. There you go. That's all I have to say. Excellent. Which means from the very beginning, Islam was created to attack Jesus Christ. If the earliest inscriptions that we see here on the Dome of the Rock are all against the person of Jesus Christ, his divinity, the idea of the Trinity, the fact that he is not, that Mary is not the mother of God, that he is nothing more than a son like every son, not the son of God. If that is the case, then can you understand why Islam still is attacking Christianity. We are their state greatest threat. We were their greatest threat in the seventh century. We continue to be their greatest threat because of Jesus Christ. And why we as Christians want to make sure that everybody comes back to that Jesus Christ. 
because you cannot be, you can build buildings, you can create colorful, uh, colorful protocols, you can put all kinds of coins, you can contact Jesus any way you want, but sooner or later, you're going to have to come back to him. You're going to have to come back to him as Lord. Yes, as the son of God. He has always been the son of God. He didn't begin to be the son of God. He will always be the son of God. And that's why it's so important that even though this great attack and why Islam was created really to attack Jesus, thanks Murad, Jesus still stands the test. And that's why it's so good to know that we can still support him, still go to him, love him, and be saved by him. And that's what you can do as well. God bless you. Please come on home. Thanks so much, Mel. Thanks so much, Murad. All the way there from the Middle East, Mel, all the way over there in Europe uh, from Ireland. But it's so good to know that we can, as Christians, not just ask these questions, but also go back to the very beginning and find out how it all began. This is Jay and Mel and Murad, over and out.